I'm Alexandra Nagy and I'm a PhD student in the group of Vincenzo Savona at EPFL Switzerland. And today I would like to tell you about the possibility to simulate open quantum systems with neural networks. Now the publication of these results was a bit interesting because actually three different groups came out at the same time. We all worked independently and got to similar conclusions. So the reference to their works, including ours, I will show you at the end of the slide. So why study open quantum systems? The study of these models gained significant interest in recent years due to experimental progress in several areas. For example, simulating systems with atoms in optical lattices or coupled microcavity arrays. And as the name says, these systems are open, which means they have a unique dynamics which leads to the emergence of several multitude phenomena. For example, dissipative phase transitions, which makes this system interesting for us to study. Now, today I will not have time to go into details about the physics of the derivations of these equations. So I will just try to get, give you a clear idea on what we wanted to solve, how we solved it, how well it worked. So let's start with what are open quantum systems. We can imagine a quantum mechanical setup which is composed of two subsystems, a small system of interest, which is coupled to a large external environment. Then the time evolution of our subsystem only will be covered by the so-called Lindbladian master equation. This is covered by a competition between a Hamiltonian coherent unitary dynamics and the dissipative processes which occur with the gamma decay rate. But you don't have to remember this equation. I will encompass everything in the so-called Lindbladian superoperator and express our time evolution in a very simple form. What is important to notice here, that the size of this system scales with the square of the Hilbert space. What does this mean practically? That we can solve this exactly for nine spins or 10 if we push it, but larger than that, we would need hundreds of gigabytes of memory. So we are not going to be able to store these matrices. That's why we have to start developing different numerical approaches. So if we solve this time evolution, the former solution is of an exponential form, but we have to realize that this super operator is not Hermitian anymore. Therefore, the time evolution is no longer unitary. This super operator has peculiar properties, which leads to a complex dynamics. We are lucky, however, because this complex dynamics generally leads to a non-equilibrium steady state in the long time limit. And this gives us a promising numerical approach to use the variational method to solve these systems. Why? Because when this unique steady state does exist, it corresponds to the zero eigenvalue of our Lindbladian. And as all the eigenvalues are complex valued with negative real part, this means that formally we can define the steady state density matrix as the one which maximizes the expectation value of our super operator. Now, this notation, you will see it later. This is nothing else, but I just reformed our density matrix into a vector. And I will already mention here that we have another way to utilize the variational principle by actually minimizing L dagger L instead. Why do we want to do this? Because the straightforward choice is just to use the real-time evolution. However, since it has complex eigenvalues, we will have oscillating terms in the time dynamics which makes it more harder for the optimizer to find the steady state. If we want to use L dagger L, we have a very smooth path to the steady state, except computationally, this is heavier. So which one we choose, it will depend on the problem we want to solve. So what do we need? We will need a variational ansatz. We will try to optimize it. And as I told you, we are not going to store these matrices, so we will need some type of stochastic sampling if we want to perform any type of operation. So let's start with our ansatz. From now on, I will assume a Hilbert space which is spanned in the computational basis where sigmas are labeling the local degrees of freedom. I will also assume a two-dimensional local Hilbert space which applies to a wide number of spin half models or qubits. Now, the density operator is formally expressed as the density matrix, right? But we cannot store that. So what is our ansatz? Our ansatz is going to be a function, a map with key variational parameters 
which given two input basis states will give us a density matrix element. We also have to have these ansatz to give us physical solutions, so it has to be Hermitian and positive semi-definite. A general formula to achieve positive semi-definiteness is if we prepare the density matrix as a statistical mixture. And then the only question remains, how will we represent these wave functions? So should we resort to the general variational Monte Carlo sh shapes like tensor networks or just row wave functions? And the answer is no, because these approaches are uh, sensitive to dimensionality and they are mostly suited for one-dimensional systems. Instead, the idea was, let's use neural networks, which were very successfully applied for closed Hamiltonian systems before. So how do we introduce these neural networks? For now, you can just imagine a black box. Input is our spin configuration. We have a network with some weights which were somehow trained to solve for ground state or dynamics, and it will return us a wave function coefficient. There were extensive studies made which neural networks we should use for this purpose, but the most promising one with the best result was the so-called restricted Boltzmann machines. RBMs are generative neural networks which are able to learn a distribution over their visible inputs. In quantum physics, our inputs are going to be the spin configurations. Our wave function is uh, described by a complex probability distribution which our network tries to approximate. Each RBM is composed of two binary valued layers, one for our physical layer, and the hidden layer introduces the correlations between our physical degrees of freedom. Our whole network is going to be connected through Ising interactions, and the joint probability of a hidden and a visible spin configuration is nothing else but the Boltzmann weight of this Ising Hamiltonian. Then the marginal probability of a visible spin configuration is given by summing out all the possible hidden spin configurations. And we choose this quantity to describe our wave function. Now the advantages of this ansatz is easy to grasp since we introduced intrinsically non-local correlations, so ex we expect to be good for highly correlated phases. We have no dimensionality constraints, and as representability theorems shows, the accuracy of our ansatz only depends on the number of hidden nodes we are using. So in the infinite limit of infinite hidden nodes, we can fit any function. Now let's see how we plug this back into our density matrix. In order to express the statistical form in one single RBM, we introduce an intermediate layer of L hidden nodes and choose to represent the probabilities in an RBM form. Now, in order to label these wave functions, the expression of these nodes also have to enter into the expression of the wave functions. And if we perform all the summation on the hidden nodes, we will get a final ansatz for our density matrix. Now, why do I show you this equation? Because it might not seem like that, but we should be very happy about this. It's very efficient to implement it numerically, and it will have very nice analytical derivatives by the variational parameters. Why we need that, you will see it in the next slides. And once again, the accuracy of our ansatz only depends on the hidden nodes we use. We are not restricted by the form. So how do you optimize this? We chose to rewrite the stochastic reconfiguration method for open quantum systems. What's the idea? At time t, we have a density matrix. Now, ideally, we want to follow the exact time evolution which is dictated by the Nimbladian. In practice, we are only able to change the variational parameters. This is just a linear expansion if we change the variational parameters. So what do we want to do? We want to minimize this angle. We want to achieve that when we change the variational parameters, the change density matrix corresponds to the real-time evolution. And once we do that, we get to a system of linear equations which has to be solved at each iteration step, giving us the real-time evolution of the parameters. Now the exact form of these matrices, I just show you here. Again, you don't have to really know what that is. 
I just want you to notice that first, the variational derivatives do appear, and we have to perform this operation a lot. So we need nice derivatives. And this so-called forces and covariance matrix, all these double brackets are expectation values above the variational density matrix, which we do not store. So just to evaluate these quantities, we will need stochastic sampling. We can also show, which is a bit more intuitive, that these forces are nothing else but the derivative of the expectation value of our super operator. What does this mean? It means that if we drive the evolution with this force, it will give us the real-time evolution until the steady state. If we do the other choice I told you about, and we try to drive the system with the derivatives of L dagger L, then the evolution which we get is not going to be physical, but we will get to the same steady state. So once again, if we are only interested in steady state, we might choose this. And to be even more intuitive, let's notice that if I choose the covariance matrix to be the identity, then this is just gradient of something. This is just steepest descent. Why we chose to use the stochastic reconfiguration is because it accounts for the correlation between the variables, so it's more robust against the local minima, and it has a faster convergence. About how we update these parameters, for real-time evolution, you can do higher-order methods like fourth order runge kutta Otherwise, you're good to go with an Euler approximation. Now, stochastic sampling. I think it's a quite obvious choice that we chose Metropolis-Hastings, and I think you might be familiar with that, but if not, I will just tell you a few words. So let's imagine that we want to perform this summation where P is a distribution and our phase space is just so large that we cannot possibly do this which is exactly the situation we are in. Now, for Metropolis Hastings, what we do is that we generate a sequence of samples on a way that the more and more samples we produce, the distribution of these values more closely approximates the distribution P. Now, these samples are generated sequentially, and the next one will only depend on the very last one, which makes this into a Markov chain. Doing so, the central limit the theorem will ensure us that the arithmetic mean of these samples will be an estimator of our quantity. Now, one way to achieve a very simple condition to achieve that this distribution goes to the one which we want to fit is that uh, moving on this walk in a specific direction, in average, it has to be as frequent as moving in the reverse one which is nothing as just detailed balance. And there are many ways to ensure detailed balance, and one specific choice is given by uh, Metropolis and Company by saying that accepting the next move will depend only on this probability where Q is nothing as but proposing the next state. So we are doing a random work, we go from one spin configuration to the next one, we propose one, and we accept it with this probability. So now if we are able to write our system of equation in a form that we can identify a distribution, we are good to go and we have a stochastic sampling. And uh, we can do that. I'm not going to show it for all the equations because it has no point. The only thing you have to notice is that the absolute value square of the density matrix element will play the role of a probability distribution. And uh, with this, we have everything. We have a functional ansatz which gives us density matrix elements. So we can sample all the quantities in our linear system, which if we solve, tells us how to adapt the network weights until we reach the steady state, which is quite typical variational Monte Carlo scheme. But if you look at it more, you might notice that this is actually nothing else than reinforcement learning. So the idea of using neural networks here is not so unrelated as it could seem first. Now about the implementation. The basic algorithm is very simple, right? We have a loop on our optimization, and each iteration step we have to perform a metropolis hastings. What are the bottlenecks? First of all, I told you this metropolis hastings is Markovian, so it's an embarrassingly parallel task. Second, we have to update these factors and matrices, whose size scales with the number of parameters. 
So if we want to be more accurate or describe larger systems, these matrices will be large and it will be a huge computational overhead. So why did we decide to optimize this thing? Uh, because we had to, because it was just extremely slow and we couldn't do more than six pins. So instead what we did, we decided to do the Metropolis Hastings in a parallel manner and all these matrix vector updates were pushed on GPUs. Also the solver of our linear problem was pushed on GPU because we used an iterative solver, which is once again a matrix vector multiplication. And uh, it was worth it because for 16 spins around 1000 parameters, we went from one iteration step taking 20 minutes to one minute, which is a game changer. And then this code, we run it on a computational cluster at EPFL. Okay, now about the results. Um, what I will show you is different spin systems and they are all interesting for some reasons which I don't have time to completely explain. What I want you to take from this side, slides is that how diversely this ANSATS works for us. So I will show you first a two-dimensional spin model with a driven dissipative phase transition, which is the most difficult problem we can choose in open systems. Second, I will show you real-time evolution in a system which is experimentally realizable, so we can actually have benchmarks. And third, if I have time, I will show you results for a transfer field Ising model where I actually used L dagger L to converge to the steady state. So let's start with the two-dimensional Heisenberg model. So what I'm showing you here is an observable, a spin structure factor. Let's just not look at it for now, it's just an observable. What I want you to see is that I'm plotting it as a function of my hidden node density, and this is the exact result. And just as we expected, if I increase the number of hidden nodes, my, uh, my value at steady state converges to the accurate result. So from now on, every plot I show you will already went through this benchmark test and we checked if we saturated in accuracy or not. And now let's see a dissipative phase transition. So what I didn't tell you yet, that this model is interesting for us because it has a phase transition. We have a competition coming from the spin dissipation which competes with the spin flips, which is induced by an anisotropic Hamiltonian. And what quantity do I plot here? Again, this spin structure factor, just because this can detect the phase transition. It's zero in one phase and non-zero in the other one. What I do here is I span the parameter region and I show you this observable for different lattice sizes. And what I want you to see here, that we can span through this region which is for us very difficult to simulate. And this is not even just a phase transition because if you imagine a two dimensional phase diagram, we cross a boundary, but all the time we are crossing, we are actually on a different phase boundary. So we couldn't have chosen more difficult region to study. Then I also wanted to show you a real time evolution. This is a different spin model. We can experimentally realize it with Rydberg atoms and I'm showing you the time evolution of the magnetization, which is again, the takeaway message. We can simulate this with a very modest number of hidden nodes. We only use the same number of hidden nodes as our visible nodes, which is low. And again, if we wanted a bit more accuracy, we can just increase the number of hidden nodes. Now, for just to show you this is, happens if I drive our time evolution with L dagger L. We have no real time evolution. We go directly to steady state. And what you have to see is that even for 25 spins and a modest number of hidden nodes, the expectation value of this quantity goes to zero, which signals us that we are at the steady state. And I just want to emphasize that this is not how variational Monte Carlo works. Usually you minimize the system's energy, but you don't know what is the minimum. In our case, we minimize this quantity, but we do know that we have to go to zero. So we see how close we get to zero, quantifies us how well our approximation is. And with this, I would like to conclude my talk. 
I showed you a neural network ANSATS for open quantum systems, which is efficient and robust in optimization. It's well adapted for many core computing, and I also showed you some results on different spin models, which included phase transitions and real-time evolution. And uh, just to mention, now we have a working version also for bosons, which is basically the same REM, just we plug in integer values instead of spin halves. And uh, if you are interested in the details, which I didn't tell you, you can find our article online. And for the reference for the other group's paper, you can check out this PRL viewpoint. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Alexander. Time for questions. People are getting tired. Okay, from my side, if there is no anybody, I cannot see. So, the, do you have any kind of real system with what you can compare this, so you can really test it? You mean a real life yeah. system? Yeah, this uh, real-time evolution which I showed you. This is actually this is the spin model which they simulate in real life with Rydberg atoms. So, okay, this is a simulation, but now we are in talk with these groups that we want to benchmark their experiments. And uh, for the first, uh, in the very beginning, somewhere you mentioned your assumption and uh, yeah. this easing type of uh, restriction is not so strong for this. Kind ah, of yeah, I see. Uh, yeah, for yeah, the Hilbert space. Exactly. Um, it's strong in the sense that, so we can extend it to bosons. So lattice models are easy. And, uh, but other than that, we have to be a bit more careful about our ansatz. Okay. But uh, for us, in open systems, the typical models which we study is bosons or spin lattices. Mm -hmm. So we didn't think about that much more because it was perfect for us. Donny would have another question. Yeah, well, I have one question. I'm not familiar with Boltzmann machines, but uh, how are there any hyperparameters that you need to fine tune to get this wall set up to work or, or there are none and you just change the number of hidden layers and that's it and everything works? Um, we have to be a bit tricky with the time step, which is our learning rate basically, because especially close to a phase transition, uh, the maximal time step we can allow is inversely pro proportional to the Lindbladian gap, which is the first excited state. And at a phase transition, this gap is closing, so our time step has to be extremely so, uh, small in order to converge. But other than that, the only thing we had to tune is the number of hidden layers. Thank ah, you. Sorry, and also we have to regularize this linear system because it's singular, so also we have an adapted regularization to be able to solve it. Thank you very much. Okay. Anybody else? Oh, go to bed. Huh? <laughs> okay, so let's thanks Alexandre again.